This is Dane Wigington with geoengineeringwatch.org. Today I have the distinct pleasure and honor of an extraordinarily important exchange and short interview with an individual, former extremely high-ranking officer with the U.S. Air Force that has shown immense courage and fortitude by being willing to speak out on an issue that is of unimaginably grave importance, the climate engineering, geoengineering issue. This former two-star U.S. Air Force Major General was scheduled to speak in Redding, California on July 28th, had already flown to California, was on his way to the Redding event, when for the second time in a week, the Redding event was canceled due to the completely unprecedented wildfires raging through the U.S. West. Wildfires, by the way, that all available frontline data makes clear are directly related to the ongoing geoengineering, climate engineering operations. Without further delay, I want to have former U.S. Air Force General Rich Rolig give us his resume. And again, my deepest gratitude to General Rolig for joining us on this exchange. General, can you tell us who you are, briefly your background, and what brought you to this issue? Not a problem. Um, I served 34 years on active duty, but I like to think of myself as serving 56 years in the Air Force. My father was a career SAC bomber pilot, flew in World War II, so I was raised in the Air Force and then went through ROTC at Miami of Ohio and went on active duty in 1966, retired 34 years later in 2000. So I've been a ret retired officer for the last 18 years, but I also continued in the field of my specialty by working for Raytheon for 10 years. Um, main career path for me was an acquisition that's developing research and development of new weapon systems. Some of the titles I held uh, head of Contracting and Manufacturing for Air Force Materiel Command, Commander of the Air Logistics Center at Ogden, Utah. I've been a base commander, contracting officer, and I was a program manager for a highly classified tri-service standoff attack missile. So a little bit of variety of things all in developing weapon systems. And, and again, the, the years that you actually ran Hill Air Force Base, how many years? Um, I went there in, uh, uh, let's see, those were my last two and a half years on active duty. So, you know, 97 to 2000. Now, if I may, before I, I press on with other questions, I, I would like to read a very short excerpt from another former U.S. Air Force Major General that is working with geoengineeringwatch.org, uh, a, a, a general whom you know and have spoken to with our attorneys on our attorney conference calls. If I can read one short excerpt, and then I want to go back to a question for you, uh, General Rolig. In the book, Geoengineering, A Chronicle of Indictment, former U.S. Air Force General Charles Jones, who is also a U.S. Air Force tactical weather reconnaissance pilot, makes the following Shocking statements on the record. Quote, this is from General Jones. I, I want to point out to people, General Rolig, that you are not alone in stepping up to try to address these programs. General Jones stated this. When people look up into the sky and see white trails paralleling and crisscrossing high in the sky, little do they know that they are not seeing condensation, quote, but instead are witnessing a man-made climate engineering crisis facing all air-breathing humans and animals on planet Earth. 
These white aircraft spray trails are the result of scientifically verifiable spraying of aluminum particles and other toxic heavy metals, polymers, and chemicals. These toxic atmospheric aerosols are used to alter weather patterns, creating droughts in some regions and deluges and floods in other locations. Even extreme cold can be created by climate engineering under other conditions. Unfortunately, these unfolding catastrophes are not capturing the attention of America's citizens nor politicians. Weather warfare has already almost reached beyond the possibility of devastation to all mankind and animals. It is that serious and it is time limiting. Signed, General Charles Jones, Brigadier General, U.S. Air Force. General Rowling, what brought climate engineering to your attention? Well, I live in Tucson, Arizona. Davis Montham Air Force Base is located here. And uh, there were some comments that I read online. And then I started noticing the same thing they were talking about, which was streams that were not condensation from the aircraft from Davis Montham. And it brought my curiosity and my wife's curiosity up. So we started researching, ran across your website, and got access to your information. So it was from a just a personal concern in the local area where we reside. Now, given that you've put such a major portion of your life into the service of this country, you've given a huge portion of your life to the service of this country, what did you feel when you learned about the geoengineering issue? What do you feel now about that issue? Why and who? The transparency that you would expect on something like this, to a certain extent, is not there. And that concerns me. Now, I have to also state that I firmly believe there are reasons why some operations should not be made open to the public. If Climate engineering is being used in any capacity as a quote-unquote weapon system for a potential use, then I do believe that should remain classified. But those are specific programs. But if it's being used and it looks like, at least in our skies, I can see those trails and they're coming down, it caused me concern that there was no acknowledgement of what exactly was happening and the potential impact to the population. Now, I, I, I will elaborate more on the, the historical documentation of the weapons use in a moment. On, on, the, on this particular theme, though, the top U.S. military commanders, top U.S. military commanders have repeatedly stated on the record that the greatest threat to U.S. national security, to U.S. military security, is climate change, is the imploding climate and biosphere. Given this acknowledgement, again, from top U.S. military leaders, should we, the U.S. population, believe that our government and the U.S. military would ask our permission before deploying global climate intervention operations, including over the continental U.S. and U.S. civilians? Should we believe they would ask our permission before deploying? Not necessarily. Without knowing the specifics, I can't give you a definitive answer. But the fact is, do you believe that there is research and development going on with weather as potential weapon systems? Now, if it impacts, if any weapon system impacts the community that it's being developed in or tested in, then yes, there needs to be some acknowledgement. As an example, in the Nevada area, when they were doing testing of nuclear weapons, you know, that had to be acknowledged to the population. I mean, that's a strong example. But the point is, what acknowledgement are they doing now to make sure that as they're testing and developing, there's not a byproduct that's impacting the population? Well, certainly that's a very rational uh, guideline that we would hope they would follow. But if I could I, I don't know that I, I see any precedence that that would be followed in that the nuclear testing done in the continental U.S. was not disclosed till after that testing was done. We now have peer-reviewed study to prove 
that unfortunately that nuclear testing that was for the de- further development of nuclear weapons was responsible for the deaths of 450,000 U.S. civilians. We have peer-reviewed study to prove this from the, the toxic fallout, the nuclear fallout. So that's something that almost no Americans know or understand, that that nuclear testing, and this done in our country, killed that many U.S. civilians as a direct result of that testing. And unfortunately, it doesn't seem that there has been any effort to halt or cease or alter this type of practice with such grave consequences. And this is not taking into account the mortality that, that occurred in the South Seas where other testing was done. Nuclear contamination now that's that's rearing its head again from some of the disposal sites that are now deteriorating and, and exposing more nu- nuclear fallout even today. Moving on, and this is directly related to climate engineering, so bear with me. I'm not, I'm not going off course here. I'm, I'm weaving this into climate engineering. 9-11 was inarguably a new Pearl Harbor event in regard to the effect it had on the U.S. population. This event, more than any other, galvanized unquestioning public support for not just U.S. public, but globally, for military intervention in the Middle East and elsewhere. Have you seen the on-film testimony of General Wesley Clark stating he was given a list of the Middle Eastern countries that would be targeted after 9-11. He was given that list one week after 9-11. Have you seen De- General Wesley Clark's testimony about that list? Yes. With that in mind, what are your thoughts about the fact that every one of these targeted countries has been subjected to a once in 1,000 year drought since that time? The precipitation reduction in these countries has been so severe that is, it has actually destabilized these countries. And if I could finish with this and then get your thoughts. Have you seen also the reports from military leaders of some of these countries, most recently Iran, that have accused Western militaries of cutting off their precipitation with climate engineering operations? What are your thoughts on this scenario and these accusations? It would be easy to say you draw the natural conclusion that since we made the statement by a U.S. citizen, senior officer, that we're responsible But without proof, I will not take that statement. No, not asking you to acknowledge and confirm that, of course. Um, I'm just curious of uh, your your feelings about that accusation being made. Have you seen the film of uh, Security Advisor John Bolton, current advisor to the current administration, stating on film and on the record that we will be in Tehran by 2019. He's just recently made this statement, a very provocative statement, but ha- have you seen that particular statement by by Mr. Bolton? Uh, no, I've, I've read it, but I have not seen it. So I just wanted to point that out, that we certainly, mathematically speaking, and, and we'll leave this subject at this, the mathematical likelihood of every one of these countries being subjected to a once in 1,000 year drought is certainly a statistical zero without some form of climate intervention. And I, would, I just want to point that out for the record. Have you seen the U.S. military document owning the weather by 2025? Not uh, sure if... No, I have not. It, it, this is something that, you know, again, people can look up and, and investigate on their own, but it certainly it's a stated purpose of the, of the benefit of weather as a, quote, force multiplier in conflict. And, and people ask us, and this is, I want to get your thoughts on this, General Rolig. People ask, ask us at geoengineeringwatch.org, why would the U.S. military want to control the weather? And, and certainly people who ask this have never seen, for example, which I believe you have seen, General Rolig, the film footage and audio of then Vice President Lyndon Johnson in 1962 raving like a lunatic stating that we had the power to control the weather then, over a half century ago, and that he who controls the weather controls the world. You've seen this video, I think, correct? Correct. I would ask this then, given that long history, that acknowledgement, and for those who ask us why would the military want to control the weather, 
why wouldn't the military want to use the weather's weapon? And I'm not focusing on just our military. Let me state that clearly for the record. Not doing that at all. We know, we absolutely know, Chinese military, Russian military, and others have long since been engaged in climate engineering, geoengineering programs. So I'm not focusing on just our military. I, I, I don't want to paint that picture. But when history proves, in fact, that weather warfare has been used, such as Project Popeye in Vietnam, wouldn't it be logical to assume that our military as well would want to use weather as a weapon? Absolutely. And given that, the statement of the U.S. military on the record that climate change is the greatest national security threat, would it not be a logical assumption? And again, I'm not I'm not asking you to confirm this. I know you can't. But given that statement, again, by top U.S. military brass, wouldn't it seem logical for them to intervene in climate engineering operations if they felt it was a national security, th- if the imploding climate was a national security threat? The answer is yes. So given that... Many people choose, your perspective on this is very important. Many people choose to believe that there would be countless military whistleblowers lining up to sound the alarm on climate engineering if it was actually going on. What are your thoughts on this narrative? What's the fact of the matter in regard to people's notion that, again, there would be countless whistleblowers lining up to tell their story in this issue if it was going on? What's the what's the true underlying factors in regard to such a conclusion? Programs of that nature, in my mind, would be classified. Not going into what level, whether confidential, secret, or top secret, or even SCI, which is special compartmentalized. If some program is classified Why would you expect people that have a clearance on that program to step forward when they're going to impact their livelihood, their career, and their possible jail sentence that would go along with a release of classified information? And these are people dedicated to the service of their country. So I don't expect people to step forward. It would be very unusual to have people cleared on those programs to readily step forward outside of their clearance. And the consequences after they've signed confidentiality agreements, which remain for life, correct? Correct. Even when you depart the program, you still are held to that standard. And the consequences, depending on the scenario, can be quite grave. Is that correct? Extremely. I mean, you're talking career ending and imprisonment in some cases. So (laughs) that's a very serious situation. And, And given the fact that we know the ability for surveillance to occur on every level, would you say that it's correct to to conclude that now more than ever, more than ever before, if anybody that was part of these programs attempted to communicate, speak out about this issue, that that would be incredibly risky to say the least, that that would be discovered quite readily if it reached any sort of level of uh, notoriety, that that would be um, discovered and uh, used against them quite readily, correct? Correct. Now, you've, General Rolig, you've participated in conference calls with our legal alliance, our attorneys, our legal alliance to stop geoengineering. And you've given us input on how to more effectively craft our FOIAs, our Freedom of Information Act requests, which we are finally getting some response from NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, because we had to sue their overseeing agency of the Department of Commerce. Unfortunate that we had to do that in order to get information that we were legally entitled to. In your opinion, what hurdles do our attorneys face in regard to their attempts to actually acquire 
relevant information on the climate engineering issue? What hurdles do they face? Well, the first one is, is that information classified? Then it's the answer point blank is you're not going to get a copy. So, and that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Then there is a, a set process to go through review to redact if anything is required before they release any freedom of information material. So it's not like in one or two days you're going to get a flat answer. It's going to take a little bit. But I think the biggest obstacle, as I said at the beginning, is the fact that it's classified and no one's going to get access to it. And that's indeed the bottom line. And, and thank you for making that clear. You, you worked for Raytheon for 10 years after you retired from the military. During that entire time, did you ever hear about or see any information about climate engineering? And, and certainly I'm not asking you to disclose any classified information, which of course I know you can't. I'm, I'm only asking about unclassified discussion or reports that would have in any way brought the climate engineering, geoengineering issue to your attention. No, nothing at all. Now, on that theme, can you elaborate for us? Can you tell us about the standard compartmentalization process in the U.S. military? You mean to compartmentalize uh, classified material? Uh, compartmentalization of various operations so that many involved in those operations don't really know the bigger picture. They're not given the parts to the puzzle to form the bigger picture. They're simply kept compartmentalized so that um, the individual components of whatever uh, program is we're discussing um, aren't really able to form a bigger picture conclusion and thus are less likely to become alarmed at what they're working with, working on, or a part of? Well, you first start out at the higher headquarters level with program direction and funding. Some, sometimes you periodically have to go up and report status as they review budgets on subsequent years before they decide whether to keep the funding going and everything. But just because you're let's say, in the Pentagon or at a major command headquarters and it flows through your office for either funding or program direction, that doesn't necessarily mean you know the status of it the next year, the year after, or the year after that. Those briefings sometimes can be requested, sometimes they're necessary. Now, when the program flows down, it can flow to a research and development laboratory structure to get certain elements developed prior to being pulled together, or you can go directly outside and compete or go sole source, depending on what the subject matter is, with a defense contractor, and he can portray that type of material in-house and build that for you, either in the laboratories, building models, test systems, or final production units by a contractor, but he's under the same controls as anybody on the U.S. government side in terms of release of material. So this this compartmentalization, though, I mean, would you not be perhaps a case in point of, given that we know that the climate engineering operations have been fully deployed uh, starting with the polar regions for some 70 years or more, ramped up along the way. But the fact that those operations were not a part of what you did, what your service was in the military, and thus did not come to your attention while you served in the military, is that would that not be an example of that type of compartmentalization? Absolutely, unless for some reason my unit or myself personally was exposed to it, there is no need for me to have that information and that would be a normal tracking on classified programs. So to weave this back in to what we stated earlier about the confidentiality agreements with those who are specifically involved, 
by by not directly involving so many people, compartmentalization, one, you're weeding out those people who would know enough about the entire situation to even have the inclination to talk out, and two, those who are directly involved are bound completely by these agreements, so thus we're back to the fact that to think that there would be, or the public's notion, some of the public, that if this was going on, there would be uh, lines around the building of people waiting to blow the whistle, obviously that's a very mistaken uh, notion, correct? Absolutely. Uh, now, a, only a couple more questions, General. And I, 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 again, I greatly value your time, and I, I can't express my regard for you for, for how far you've gone already to to help address this critical issue and, and bring it to public attention. You're a part of a group that's composed of many retired, high-ranking U.S. military personnel and many, I believe, still employed defense industry executives. Have you attempted to introduce the subject of climate engineering to them? And if so, what has been the response? Yes, there is a uh, group um, in Tucson that uh, constitutes military, civilian, community leaders that for about nine months out of the year go through a series of briefings brought forth on topics that might of, be of interest. One of them is climate engineering. It's scheduled for this coming year in terms of the pro side and the negative side. So it, it has come to their attention, but, but on the, let me mention sure, sure. all of the open publications, media attention on that subject has raised the attention level of these individuals. Personally, they're not exposed to it. It's not something that was through their career, whether they were a professor, a lawyer, a small business developer, etc. But from a personal standpoint, there's been enough in the media on that subject that, and I'm on the board that goes through the selection of topics for the next year. We made a decision to at least bring someone in on both sides of that subject. And I have offered for more data to be brought forward if that topic remains to be of concern to these community leaders in terms of more data and analysis of what has been going on. But I need to see what's going to happen in the two presentations that are scheduled for next year. Now, if I could clarify on the first that the... The group that you're in, again, involves a a number of high-ranking officers like yourself, also Raytheon executives, defense contractor that we know from patents and uh, other documents are the organization as a whole, not everyone in Raytheon, of course, is definitely involved with holding patents on climate engineering, uh, doing all the modeling for National Weather Service and NOAA, which we know from a federal gag order there is as you know now, a federal gag order on all National Weather Service and all NOAA employees, the nation's weathermen. And we know from our FOIA requests that have been answered that the, quote, weather forecasts are passed down from the top all the way to the local meteorologist level so that they are virtually reading scripts, parroting scripts that are, again, drafted ultimately by defense contractor Raytheon. But those executives that you know and yourself and so forth – Because you weren't a part of this program and these operations, even though you were a part of that company, these programs were unknown to you. And and thus, the the presenters that you're going to have in your group are presenting even on the pro and the negative of climate engineering as if climate engineering – is still not going on, correct? I mean, that's that's the premise from which they're approaching this, just, approaching this, just like all official sources, just like mainstream media, that uh, the, the stated presentations are still being put forth on the position that climate engineering is just a proposal, correct? Correct. This, yes, those two individuals selected have nothing to do with Raytheon, Even the internal members of that group that come from Raytheon are, and I've talked to them personally, are not attached and do not have information on climate engineering. Because you've got to remember, just this Raytheon site here in Tucson has 12,000 employees. 
not to mention the other major business sites. So this particular site, as best I can tell, with my unclassified exposure and having worked there, is not directly involved in climate engineering, nor are those representatives that are part of that group. But would you say in your estimation, though, if if an employee from that huge firm, and again, we, we all know what a major part of the U.S. employment economic activity and dependence on on the defense industry is the the private defense contractors are a huge part of the economy in our country if if people that worked at that raytheon facility even if not involved even if that facility is not involved if anyone took an interest in this issue and brought it up or tried to bring it to light that's currently employed wouldn't that be a very bad career decision for them it could be that's correct. So, again, for people who um, ask the question why everybody's not lining up to blow the whistle, I would bring all those things to light. Almost done, Rich. Thank you for bearing with me. In your estimation, General Rolig, would you would you say that the majority of the former military personnel and defense industry executives that you know believe – that they personally believe that any activity the U.S. military and defense industry is involved with would necessarily be for the good of the American population. In in summary, would you say the majority or perhaps even the whole of the military officers and defense industry executives you know would conclude that our government and the U.S. military would never engage in any activity that would ever harm innocent U.S. civilians? Is that, would you say that that's their blanket assumption or are they giving the amount of information we we now have access to, do they question that narrative? That's, (laughs) That's, <laughs> okay, this is a personal view. I understand. When you dedicate your life and your career to something like the United States, and you go through all the other aspects that you can, whether you're a trained pilot or combat leader on ground or a developer of weapon systems, you're doing that for the national security You're not doing it to see the impact on the general population. I understand. And in the course, in the course of that um, particular lens, and given what we know now, is it difficult? And I can only imagine it is. It must be. But is it difficult to examine information? that would be in, in direct conflict with uh, much of what perhaps you once believed or hoped was true in regard to the the actions of our military and our government. And again, I, I want to I clarify this. There are, there are many honorable people in our military, such as yourself, and I have never, ever stated otherwise. But what I'm I'm trying to get at here is that in the course of having such a motive to actually serve the people of this country, is it not necessary, in fact, imperative, an obligation, no matter how dire the truth is, that we have an obligation to look at that truth, especially when it when it pertains to the welfare of the American population and the in this case, the earth as a whole on which our lives all depend, is it not an obligation for those in the military to examine the facts, even if those facts are in complete contradiction to everything they formerly believed and would like to still believe? Is it not our obligation? Is it not the obligation of those in the military to examine the facts no matter how dire? Well, of course, because you want to know the impact of what you're doing. (laughs) I mean, years ago when I was involved in the initial development of the laser-guided bomb, of course you wanted to know what impact the laser out there being utilized had the impact besides a bomb with its receiver being able to connect to it and be guided. Those are natural reactions. Now, given what I know I've sent a lot of satellite imagery to you, in this case, let's if I can give one last example before closing, in the case of the 
fires that are incinerating the U.S. West. Unprecedented fires. Now we know all-time record fires. Uh, fire behavior that is completely unprecedented. Same thing happening in Portugal, Spain, Sweden, Norway, Greece. I could go on and on. But when we have satellite imagery that shows clearly completely unnatural cloud formations with the the trails that are left from aircraft that are exactly what is described by climate engineering operations and we know the effect of these operations with aerosolizing the atmosphere diminishes and disperses and disrupts the hydrological cycle in the case of california again every single day we see unimaginably massive operations off our coast that are absolutely blocking the inflow of any moist air, let alone precipitation. Uh, Do you find that alarming? And do you believe that it is imperative that we force this issue to the light of day, force investigation, force discussion, force dialogue, again, force disclosure? Do you believe that that is a great imperative at this point. Absolutely. We need to know who and why, and depending on the impact, how to adjust it. Or, in fact, if all available data indicates that there is no benevolence in these programs, that perhaps some very bad advice has been given to top people in the U.S. military about these programs, not just our military, by the way, others around the world, other governments as well, not singling out our own, but in in bringing this issue to light, and if the data indicates, and I would argue it absolutely does indicate, there is no benevolence in these programs, the interference with Earth's life support systems, then after disclosure, I personally believe that the only way we can stop these programs, the only way, is to wake up enough of the U.S. military so that they understand what they're a part of, so that they understand that the advice being given by scientists with a vested interest in propagating these programs are exposed for that deception. And thus, we might have a chance of exposing and halting these programs. In closing, do you intend to continue your investigation of this issue and your attempt to bring this issue to light. Absolutely. General Rolig, all available frontline data makes clear the Earth's climate systems and countless ecosystems, both terrestrial and aquatic, are unraveling by the day. All available frontline data indicates climate engineering is further fueling the unraveling of Earth's life support systems. Just for the record to confirm that we are in agreement that we need to get this data out in the open, into public discussion, into environmental impact review, so that we can examine what's happening, what the effects are, and what the rational course of action would be from this point in regard to these programs that have not been disclosed. Would you, would you say that that's a reasonable course of action for us all to focus on the disclosure of these programs? Absolutely. Get the data out there, the impacts, so they can be modified, canceled, whatever is required to take into consideration the impact of that or any other program on the population and the ability for this world to be maintained. Thank you. For me personally, I want to express my deepest gratitude to you and to General Jones for your courage or willingness to step forward and I I hope, I pray that your courage will inspire others in the military, others in the defense industry of which we know there are many honorable people who are serving with honorable motives but we know that motives alone are not enough that facts data, effects, consequences must also be examined and considered so in closing again General Oleg, I wish to express my deepest gratitude to you. We will continue to involve you with our attorney conference calls, our ongoing legal effort. And from geoengineeringwatch.org, I wish to express again my deepest gratitude to you, sir. Thank you.